Hi there, everybody. Welcome to Journey of Faith. If you're new with us today here in Manhattan Beach or we're connected right now with our Torrance campus, uh, hi to everybody at Torrance, or you're watching online, if you're new with us, thanks so much for being with us for the first time. My name is Jason Cusick. I'm the lead pastor here at the church, and uh, great that we can be together today. Hey, before I get into the message part of our service, I just wanted to spend a moment and pray for the Swanson family, the Manhattan Beach police officer who was who was uh, killed in a motorcycle accident. Uh, maybe you heard about it on the news. It was just this week, and uh, he was on duty. It was a really bad accident. So could we just take a minute and pray for him, for the family and friends, coworkers, our community? Thanks. Gracious God, we lift up to you the Swanson family, um, family and, and, and friends, and the, the larger community that was supportive of Officer Swanson. The vigil the other night was a, a great sign of support. God, there's a lot of grief in that family right now, a lot of grief in our world for a lot of the stuff that's going on right now. You're a God of love and a God of peace, and you have a way of taking us from times of darkness into times of light. Pray that you would be a comfort and a support to the family. Help us rally around not only the Swanson family, but also um, any family in our lives right now that's going through a difficult time as well as the stuff happening in the world. We, we lift them up to you, and we look to you and ask for your blessings in Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for that. Um, today we're on week five of our five-week series. So this is the last message in our series called Positive Influence, and we've been talking about how we can be a positive influence in our negative world. We're all influencers, in a way, with uh, friends, family, uh, at school, on our jobs. How can we be a positive influence? So we've been looking at the life of Jesus, who was not only a positive influence with his friends and his family, but he was even a positive influence with the people that were against him. And we're looking at kind of some character traits, some principles that can help us in our lives. Here's some of the things that we've covered throughout this series, and if you missed any of these messages, you can check out our YouTube channel, you can check out our website, as well as our social media page has uh, some additional readings, some videos to watch, and um, we also have some discussion guides. If you wanted to go back through this series, there's some questions to ask, even some other passages of scripture that we've been looking at in those discussion guides that can help you. Today, we're talking about this fifth Uh, principle, which is commitment. Being a positive influence is not a one and done thing. We want to be people of positive influence in the long run. We want to keep going. And what does it take to have the commitment to keep going, especially when times get tough? In August of this year, as a church, we went through a a series of messages that we called Dive In, and it was all about our mission as a church. And so the theme of that series was a pool party. So we had a bunch of pool party stuff all over the place, and we had dunk tanks uh, outside, and we just had a great time with it, uh, kind of imagining what would our mission be like if we were inviting everybody to a pool party. So one of the things we decided to do as a team is we said, hey, if you're gonna be on this platform, try to wear something that's like pool party attire. And I don't have any pool party attire. that That is not of interest to me. I don't have any of that stuff. So I went out shopping and I was like, I gotta find a shirt that would be like a pool party shirt. Well, I found one and I loved it. It's awesome, here's a picture of it. It had these orange slices on it. And boy, I love that shirt. And uh, I said, this is gonna be great. So I put on the shirt, I came to church, I got up here, and within five minutes of my message, I was like, this is a big mistake, because this shirt is not breathing at all. It's a tight shirt, I started to get really hot. I was like, how am I gonna make it through 30 minutes of talking? I was like, this is not a good idea. Well, I buried, barreled through it, I got my, in my head space properly, but after I got off of this platform, I went to my office, and I was like, I'm gonna pass out, this is crazy. I grabbed a big old glass of water, I drank I drank so much water that it spilled all over the front of my shirt. So now I have this wet shirt in front of me. Now I'm committed 
to this shirt. I actually thought it was a great shirt. I was like, I am gonna wear this, but now I have to dry off the front of my shirt. So I look down and I'm like, well, where is it wet? And I couldn't tell where it was wet because of the pattern of the shirt and the texture of the shirt. I was like, this thing is wet, but I can't see where it's wet. That's where I got the idea. I took off the shirt and I soaked it in ice water and then I put it back on. So when I came out for our second service, I was wearing a shirt drenched in ice water. So here's a video of me speaking. That shirt is drenched in ice water and I'm having a great time. I was just like, this is wonderful. I got air conditioning kind of all over my body. Okay, turn that off. So, I mean, it was just like, this is amazing. I was thinking, how can I get through this service to do what I'm supposed to be doing? And I was looking for, I need to muscle up. I need to get my head space right. I was looking for something within myself to keep going. But what allowed me to keep going was something from outside myself, that refreshing ice water in my shirt. The same is true when we talk about positive influence. Sometimes we're trying to be a positive influence and that person is just wearing on us. That situation is too much. I'm tired, I'm worn out. These people have tried my patience. I'm not sure I can do this anymore. So our temptation is to go, well, let me muster up the strength from inside me. Let me be stronger. Let me be more positive. Let me get more power. Let me get more information. And we're looking for stuff internally when in fact sometimes the most influential thing that can help us continue to be positive comes from outside of us. And that's our main idea for today. We can be a positive influence by what? By staying intimately connected to God. To continue to be a positive influence isn't about us doing it in our own self-sufficiency. It's about us being open to God who wants to influence our life. That's how we can do it in the long term. So today I wanna share with you a story that Jesus told that that kind of shows us a little bit of what some of that intimate connection with God could look like. Here's where we can find it in the New Testament of the Bible, Luke chapter 18. Luke is the third book in the New Testament. It records some of the life and teachings of Jesus, kind of his greatest hits. And if it's been a while since you have read the book of Luke, maybe you've never read the book of Luke, I wanna encourage you to do that. Uh, The book of Luke is filled with such great teachings about Jesus' wisdom and these amazing events from his life. Uh, This coming week on social media, we will give you a reading plan if you wanna follow that, that can help you kind of walk through, but maybe you wanna spend the rest of this year just kind of going through the book of Luke and reading about the life and teachings of Jesus. And if you didn't notice, through this Positive Influence series, we've been either drawing from some event in the book of Luke or going back to the book of Luke. So a lot of this series has been kind of inspired by what we've seen in this book of the Bible. Today, we're gonna look at a story that Jesus told about two men, and these two men's attempt to interact and connect with God in two very different ways. And then we're gonna finish our service by re-singing a couple of the songs that we sang, and it's gonna be kind of an opportunity for us to recommit toward each of us having an intimate connection with God. So let's jump into the story. We'll read it all the way through the first time and then go back and wanna share with you some details that I found. It's Luke chapter 18, here's what it says. Two men went to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee, the other one a despised tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed this prayer. I thank you, God, that I'm not like other people, cheaters, sinners, adulterers, certainly not like that tax collector. I fast twice a week, I give you a tenth of my income. But the tax collector stood at a distance and dared not even lift his eyes to heaven as he prayed, 
Instead, he beat his chest in sorrow, saying, O oh God, be merciful to me, for I'm a sinner. Let's stop the story right there and just kind of go back to the beginning. It's, it's the story of two men. It says two men went to the temple to pray. The earliest copies of the New Testament were written in Greek. It literally says they went up to the temple to pray. Why does it say up? Because in first century Jerusalem, if you wanted to get close to God, you would go to the Jewish temple. And the Jewish temple was located on the Temple Mount, which means you would go uphill to it. And here's an artist's rendering of what this temple looked like. Gorgeous, amazing structure. And when you went to the Jewish temple, there were these different segments for different groups of people. So different people were allowed in different areas. And of course, the closer you were to this main area, that was really the place of privilege. You wanted to get there. It says the first guy was a Pharisee and he stood by himself. We think that he probably stood right up in this area, as close as he could get. Now, some of you are like, what's a Pharisee? In first century Judaism, there were these smaller groups of people that practiced Judaism, and the Pharisees was one of those small groups. And a Pharisee was kind of like a spiritual superhero of the faith. Pharisees were the most biblically knowledgeable. They were very devout they were very serious about their faith. And if you were looking for an example of what it looked like to follow the Jewish faith, you would look to a Pharisee. Some of Jesus' first followers were Pharisees. Paul, the great first century evangelist and missionary, was a Pharisee. Some people have connected first century Jewish Pharisees to evangelical Christians the most passionate, the most biblically knowledgeable, the most strong in their faith. Now, the phrase evangelical has fallen on some hard times because of some bad apples in the bunch, and so is the word Pharisee. In fact, if you've been around church for a while, you probably associate Pharisee with being a bad thing because of guys like this. Remember his prayer? Thank you, God. I'm not like those other people. Cheaters, sinners, adulterers. Certainly not like that tax, I wonder if the tax collector could hear him. You know, not like that guy over there. I mean, this Pharisee has to be applauded. He, he definitely fasted twice a week. He was a, a generous person. He wasn't a cheater, wasn't an adulterer. Those are good things. But this guy was like drenched in pride, which is really one of the most serious sins in first century Judaism. He probably went very close to the temple because he felt like he deserved to be there. Look at all the things I've done, God. Look how great I am. Look at how knowledgeable I am. Now, before we judge this guy, we do the same thing. Somebody says, are you a good person? Yeah, start living, I've done this, I do this, and I'm, I'm, I'm like this. And then if we start to feel like, well, I'm not really a good person, then we find somebody who's worse than us. I'm, I'm not a good person, but I'm definitely better than that lady. You know? We compare ourselves to people. We elevate ourselves. And we easily fall into a trap of judgmentalism and legalism, which was the problem of the Pharisees in the first century. They had blended their faith with judgmentalism, legalism, and politics. That was the Pharisee. Where was the other guy? It said he stood at a distance. If we go back up to the temple, he was probably over here. Now, why was he at a distance? Well, a few reasons. One, he was a Jewish tax collector that worked for the oppressive, pagan, colonizing Roman government. The people in his day saw him as the enemy. You're working for the wrong side. You got the wrong lawn sign, buddy. So they looked at him as the enemy. Also, tax collectors that worked for the Roman government were often viewed as embezzlers and extortionists, which is why that Pharisee probably said, I'm not a cheater. He was probably saying, that tax collector, he is a cheater. 
So this guy didn't get close probably because he knew people don't want me around. I don't fit in in these religious circles. I'm not, I'm not biblically knowledgeable like they do. I don't have all my life together like these religious people do. I'm gonna hang back. But he also hung back for another reason. Do you remember his prayer? He said he beat his chest in sorrow and here's what he prayed. He didn't say, God, I'm better than this person or look all the things that I did. He said, oh God, be merciful to me for I'm a sinner. The beautiful thing is how Jesus summarizes this story. You've got a very devout, biblically knowledgeable, superhero of the faith kind of dealing with pride. And then you've got a corrupt, sinful, probably embezzling extortioner working for the wrong side and the wrong people. Who leaves that place right with God? Jesus says, I tell you, this sinner, not the Pharisee, returned home, literally went back down home, justified before God. Why? Because those who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted. This second person there at the temple in this story that Jesus told was able to continue being the right kind of influence for one very significant reason, and it's a significant reason we need to understand. Like that second guy, we need to discover the transformational power of mercy. You know what mercy is? Mercy is, we'll put it right up here, (laughs) compassion instead of judgment. How easy is it for us to judge? We all go there so quick. Compassion's harder, especially when we feel like we have a just reason to judge the other person. Mercy is something different. Mercy is when we say, God, I need your mercy, and that makes it possible for me to be merciful with other people. Now, where does mercy come from? I think mercy comes from a balance of two separate things, how we view ourselves and how we view God. So let me share those with you really quick. The first part we need is we need a healthy view of our own sinfulness. Now, some of us have unhealthy views of our sinfulness. We either feel like we are the worst in the world. Maybe you grew up in a very condemning atmosphere at home or in religion that you started with, and you are the worst of the worst. You're like, I am so rotten and bad. That is toxic shame. That's an unhealthy view of sinfulness. In fact, even when you see the word sin or sinfulness, you have like this trauma response. We're like, "Uh uh-oh, is this one of those churches? Is this one of those sermons that's gonna make me feel horrible? That's not a healthy view of our sinfulness. The other unhealthy view of our sinfulness is that we just let everything go. We go, well, I'm not really sinful. I mean, make some mistakes. And we're overly easy on ourselves. Sin is when we're not aligned with who God created us to be, and all of us deal with that. And all of us have very specific expressions of how sinfulness hits us. What we need is a healthy view of our sinfulness, and then we also need a healthy view of God's goodness. That's the other side of it. See, some of us have a view of God's goodness. We go, oh, I believe in God's goodness for those other people, not me, because I'm really bad. God doesn't love me. God can't forgive me. I did that thing, or I've lived in this way, and God's goodness has run out for me. Some of you carry that with you, that toxic shame that keeps you from experiencing God's goodness and joy. Others of you are on the other side where God is more like your cosmic sugar daddy. You know, you can't do anything. Is God good to me? Yes, God loves everybody, and I'm his favorite. You know, like God made you and then just said, you do you, boo. Like, everything's fine with you. Where we have, like, no responsibility to God. Somewhere in the middle of these two is this idea that God loves me, that God's created me with purpose, And yet, 
I don't live up to that. And it's so easy for me to fall behind from that. But I'm not lost forever. God wants to restore me and keep me in relationship even though I have this bent toward moving away from God. And there's this beautiful tension that we live in between a healthy view of our sinfulness and a healthy view of God's goodness. And Jesus actually used a nature metaphor when he was talking about this. Look what Jesus says. He says, I'm the vine and you're the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. He's saying, you know what the goal is? Is for us to be intimately connected with God. And when we're intimately connected with God and we have that commitment, that ongoing commitment with God, we're, our lives become fruitful and generous and we actually influence and help other people with fruit, nourishing wonderful things to help other people. And then we also remember that without that intimate connection with God, that fruitfulness really is impossible. I need to stay in that connection. In fact, the, the word uh, remain in me, there's an English word that's used as a summary of that, and that English word is this word, abiding. It means to stay with. That's what Jesus is saying. He's saying, stay with me. If you want to live a life that lasts, if you want to keep that positive influence, if you want to be making a difference in the world like I created you to do, stay connected to me. And that connection is so beautifully modeled by that second guy in the story who didn't say, I have it all together, I'll do it on my own, look at all the great things I've done. But that man stopped and he said, God, have mercy on me. I'm a sinner. We can follow his example. In fact, ask God for mercy and forgiveness in one needed area of your life. What would that look like for you? And it might mean you have to kind of regularly remember that posture of humility and openness to mercy. I have a, a plaque in my office that I keep on my desk, and here's a, a picture of it. I brought it with me here. And I don't know if you can read it here. It says, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And I keep that plaque on my desk. And as I get into this place where I'm like, oh, I'm stressing. Oh, I gotta keep going. I start hustling. I start coming up with my own ideas about how my self-sufficiency or how my knowledge or, or I'm trying to be like, God, you know I've done this, this, and this. Please bust me in this. As I move into that place where I'm a little bit more like that Pharisee, this plaque reminds me, stop, you're a sinner. Slow down and seek the mercy of God. Reminds me of a quote by the, the late USC professor Dallas Willard. He was a philosophy professor, great author, and he wrote this. He said, hurry is the great enemy of the spiritual life in our day. This is what we need to do. We need to get into a pattern of slowing down and asking for mercy. In fact, let's do that right now. Let's just take a moment. Would you close your eyes? And I just want to give you, we're not going to play any music. It's just going to be silent in the room. Would you just take a moment and ask God for mercy in your life or forgiveness? Is there some area where like, God, help me to have mercy. Help me experience your mercy. Thank you for your mercy, Lord. Before we finish this message and go into the, the song we're gonna sing at the end, I wanna add one more point here because sometimes it's easier, sometimes it's easy for us to seek God's mercy and then we stop there. But that's not where we're supposed to stop. Part of what makes mercy truly transformational is when we receive it, we give it away. 
So here's the other thing that we need to do if we're gonna have real commitment like Jesus, help others experience God's mercy. That Pharisee, he didn't understand mercy so he couldn't give it away. He didn't appreciate that he was a sinful, flawed person that rather than putting all his trophies on the shelf for God to see, he should have been saying, God, here's where I failed. No, I'm not a cheater and I'm not a a swindler, I'm not an adulterer, but here's what I, I'm prideful. I tend to look down on tax collectors, even though I don't know their situation. I'm judging this guy right behind me. And because he couldn't appreciate and receive God's mercy for himself, he couldn't give it to that tax collector. And that's what happens with us. Next week, uh, we're gonna start a five-week series called Simple Faith, and we're gonna be looking at a Bible, a book of the New Testament that is specifically written to help us avoid becoming accidental Pharisees. Where we, we start off good by saying, I'm gonna trust Jesus, and then we get really judgmental, we get legalistic, or we get political, and then we start pushing other people away because they're not where we're at. It's kind of a, a hazard of the spiritual life. The more we grow in the spiritual life, sometimes the easier it is to look down on people that aren't where we're at. And that was, that's kind of the story of what's going on with the Pharisee and the tax collector. It's really a tension between these two things. The Pharisee was exclusionary. Look at where I'm at. Look at what I've achieved, God. I'm not like that person over there. Whereas the tax collector was like, God, I'm not gonna focus on anything that I've achieved. I need your mercy. And I think Jesus said that person left right with God. That's how we wanna go home, right with God. Hearts full of mercy and it shifts us and gives us the ability to not be so judgmental of other people. Not only not be judgmental, but when we experience mercy, we get to invite other people into it because we know what that means. That's something we can do. Invite someone into God's mercy by showing them mercy. That's how you do it. I want you to think of that person. Imagine yourself in this story as that Pharisee. Who is the person in your life that you know that you go, I'm so so glad I'm not like them I'm not living that lifestyle. I don't vote that way. I don't act like that. I want you to think of that person. That's the person that needs to receive your compassion, not your judgment. Like I said, it's so easy for us to slide into judgment. Here's what we talked about today. We can be a positive influence by staying intimately connected with God really discovering the transformational nature of mercy, asking God for mercy, appreciating, not being self-sufficient, not being focused on everything we did right, but recognizing we're flawed, we're broken, and God loves us, and stepping into that goodness, and then like Jesus, helping others experience God's mercy. The only, some of the people that you know, the only way they are gonna experience God's mercy is by your mercy. And they might actually have a lifetime of judgment from other religious people's judgment. What would it be like if you were a person of mercy? And I believe mercy is that cold ice water that drenches us, that keeps us going when we're hot and we're tired and we're like, I don't know if I'm gonna make it. And it's God drenching us with that mercy. So here's how we're gonna end our service. I'm gonna invite our our band to come out at Torrance and here at Manhattan Beach. And I want you to be thinking about this word mercy as we sing these songs and end our service together. And I wanna give a, a, a special invitation to those of you that maybe have never prayed this prayer before. God, have mercy on me, I'm a sinner. I prayed a prayer a lot like this when I was 19 years old and it changed the trajectory of my life. And I go back to that prayer regularly because it gives me the right posture when I'm tempted to be judgmental of other people. I need mercy in my life and I need to be a person that gives mercy. That's the refreshment that keeps us going. If you've never prayed a prayer of 
Jesus, have mercy on me, a sinner. I'm gonna pray a prayer right now that's kind of an example of what that could look like. And I wanna invite you to pray it along with me in your heart or in your mind, and maybe as we're singing these songs, there might be your own version of that prayer. And after the service, either outside at our connections area or over here by the cross where we'll have some prayer volunteers, or when we're hanging out having donut holes and iced coffee, talk to somebody and tell somebody, hey, I prayed that prayer for the first time in my whole life because we'd love to help you have that be part of your life and help you to take the next steps in walking in your faith. So as a symbolic way to kind of say, okay, God, I want this commitment to positive influence to keep going. Would you stand with me? And I'm gonna do this prayer and then we're gonna sing this song together. We're asking God this commitment that we wanna do, we wanna keep it going. It's not a one and done thing, but the thing that's gonna keep us going is being drenched by his mercy. Let me pray. God, you're good. You love me and I'm a sinner. I need your mercy. Jesus, thank you for what you did on the cross and today, I surrender myself to you. I don't know all that that means, but I know I need mercy and forgiveness in my life to keep going. Thank you for forgiving me, and thank you for putting me on the right track. And I commit to telling somebody about that today. In Jesus' name, amen.